All right, so JD decided this morning and tweeted me about 6.30 uh, that we should start doing a vlog. So welcome to the Jen and JD show. <laughs> We're tentatively titling this um, Snark Fest, the show about educational stuff, but that's a working title. Which is good. <laughs> And we really have no idea how to start this out. No. So really, the idea behind this is to kind of take our Twitter feed, which some of you follow, and our blogs, um, which some of you follow, and show you some live video of, of us, us. If you don't get to uh, Indiana conferences that we hang out at. Right. So I'm Jen Lamaster. I'm the director of faculty development here at Burbuff Jesuit Preparatory School. She is 40-ish Oracle on Twitter. Yes. And I'm J.D. Ferris Road, Chief Information Officer here at Burboff. Who is J.D. Ferris on Twitter. And Easy. now we're out of stuff to say. No, seriously. Okay. So what have you been up to for the last week, Jen? We have been doing a lot of BYOT boot camps. So if you don't read or follow us on various sundry channels, we are going one-to-one -one Bring Your Own Technology in the fall. And we've been working on it for three years. But this past couple of weeks, we have been intentionally and very focused on some teacher development activities that we call BYOT boot camps, where we bring the teachers in for anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours, depending on the department, and work through what a one-to-one -one environment will look like in their classroom next year. And if you had to come up with three things that you learned from the BYOT boot camps, what did you learn? Three things. Well, first, we have amazing teachers, and they have amazing ideas, and I'm astounded at some level of how easy one-to-one's going to kind of be because they have ideas that wouldn't happen otherwise. Right. So our uh, digital books wouldn't happen unless we know the students have a device. Access to our learning management system and outside blogs and websites just wouldn't happen. Um, so we have these great ideas uh, coming from teachers. And let's see, another idea or thing I have learned. Oh, when you tell a teacher that the technology is not their responsibility, that the academic learning objective is their responsibility, suddenly they get excited about teaching again. <laughs> Imagine a teacher who doesn't feel they have to learn and then teach Microsoft Word and Microsoft PowerPoint. Yes, and once you say, hey, you can tell the students that they need to do a 20-minute uh, persuasive presentation on a current social justice topic happening in the world today. But tell the student they can choose any device or any program, however they want to create their presentation, but they'll be graded on a rubric that talks about use of evidence to support claims, use of claims to support a thesis. Effective um, use of media in order to further the presentation. Right. That's exciting to teachers. And it'll be exciting to the students to try different tools and the tools they're comfortable with to do that presentation. That's huge. Three, social studies teachers eat a lot of donuts. This is good. A lot of donuts for social studies. Could be the high male, female you know, ratio there, but um, English, much more of a bagel kind of group. This is good to know, and these are the types of things that you will learn only on the Jen and JD show <laughs> or if you have a lot of social studies teachers and access to donuts and bagels. Yeah. Okay, news. News. What's going on in education news today? Okay, so we've been reading a couple of different things. We're particularly concerned about what's going on in Louisiana uh, with some of this voucher program and if you didn't get a chance to read Diane Radovich's post on the Washington Post yesterday on the answer sheet, well written, excellent snark toward the middle. I'm going to try um, and link to it on this. We'll see how good I am. Uh, but basically, if you haven't been following up, uh, we're in Indiana. We thought we had a pretty broad and liberal voucher uh, system, but Louisiana kind of one-upped us there. And apparently, there is not a lot of vetting going on with how this money works. So if you're kind of looking to hang your shingle, I would recommend uh, going down to Louisiana. Um, and some of the concerns that are in the news right now are a couple of schools that actually don't have the physical space, don't have the teachers. But got the voucher but money. But got the voucher money for hundreds of students. So we're actually talking almost millions of dollars here. Now, to be fair, though, they do have some educational practices. I mean, they're not just coming out of the woodwork and have students who have absolutely no teacher training whatsoever. 
Well, I particularly like the one school that they were mentioning where the kids sit in a cubicle with a Christian-based workbook and go through the um, anti-evolution arguments. Oh, that's educational. Self-paced. I think my favorite one, we're going to categorize this firmly under ice. Yes, it is still cold. Is um, from Ed Week this week. And I think it was this week. And what they have found... Under, under the article titled, Scientists Find That Learning Is Not Hardwired, it's, a, it's an addressing of, of neuroscience, this, this idea that our brain and our brain function and how our brain works can influence how we learn. Hmm. And, and there's a lot of debate going on right now that some of the things that teachers are being taught in teacher preparation school may not actually have some scientific foundation or may have been hmm. disproven way back when, but it's still being taught in the schools. But by far my favorite thing was the conclusion that they draw that every time you learn something, the brain changes. I was shocked. I'm amazed. <laughs> because the idea that the brain changes as you learn is phenomenal stuff. Exactly. Millions of dollars of research went in to let us know that the brain changes as you learn. Impressive. It is interesting. I mean, I'm astounded by the number of hits I'm sure this article is getting and it really doesn't say much of anything. <laughs> so I'll probably link to it just so you can you know comment and blast me for the great research going on here but seriously teachers we've got to figure out a way to start reading articles that give us some actual content and some things that we can do instead of just four pages of we haven't really learned much yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, and on the breaking news, and you can link this if you will, because I just checked my Twitter feed, apparently the um, Australian and Melbourne, Australia teachers are striking against merit pay. Gary Steger actually has a good point. We kind of rolled over and took it here. Yeah. Uh, but if you have a chance, watch the coverage, because it is impressive what the union has pulled off so we're gonna in try Australia. And, we're going to try and link to that as well, or yep. at least give you some uh, hashtags to follow yep. on that subject area. Um. We also thought it would be kind of enlightening at this stage to have a recurring uh, comment of what J Jen and JD are reading this week. Oh, okay. You really can't understand us until you kind of know. So Jen, what are you reading right now? So I actually had to make a list because I am reading absolutely thrilling things. Uh, so looking over School Leadership That Works by Marzano, classic, uh -huh. classic, worth a revisit occasionally. Uh, reading uh, GC35. Which You're going to have to tell them what GC is. <laughs> so the Jesuits get together periodically and make big sweeping statements about their um, paradigm in the world and their mission and uh, activities. And so this is the general congregation that closed in 2008, I believe, yeah, which is the last right. time. And so I am reading uh, particularly how it relates to Jesuit education and going to the frontiers and working in a global environment with technology. That's a, that's a thrilling read. Um, I'm on number three of, I think, 19 nice. decrees or so, so I'm working through it. And then on the fiction side, I'm reading The Hogfather by Terry Pratchett, because it's not summer until you read some Terry Pratchett. I am currently uh, finishing up Galapagos by Kurt Vonnegut, which is a story I started reading with my daughters, and then they forgot about it before it got really awkward, because there's, uh, there's some biology that goes on in that book that I didn't want to share with my 10-year-old. And um, let's see here. I have started Pencil Me In by John mm. Spencer. If you're not following John T. Spencer on Twitter, you need to follow him. And um, I was so inspired by Pencil Chat, I had to pick this book up. Nice. And then on the audiobook side, I am finishing Fall of Hyperion, the sequel to the um, Sword and Laser Book of the Month last month because they decided to give us a cliffhanger, and I had to read part two. Nice. Um, so that's, I, I am firmly in the fiction world, although I have to start soon because our digital citizenship course is going to have a section on student organization. So I'm going to have to start uh, reading uh, Growing Up in the Google Way or Organizing in the Google yeah, Way. Yeah, the Google That's a good one. I've read that one. Okay. It, it reminded me that I was still allowed to use Post-it notes. Post-it so notes are wonderful. Post-it notes are, are acceptable on one's monitor. Speaking of which, if you haven't read the Blogus' book yet, there is a chapter on Helpful post-it post notes she leaves for her husband that uh -huh. is laugh out loud family reading as long as you don't have kids. I would say no with kids. Uh, not suitable for children. 
But uh, we've got a product review, too, because we decided no good ed tech discussion really is complete without a product review. Yeah, sure. Isn't it all about the toys? Mm -hmm. um, and so while we have behind us the uh, computer engineer Barbie, uh, we thought we might play around with a little bit of Chromebooks. As most of you know, I am a um, huge advocate of the Chromebook. This is my mobile laptop device that I use. And one of the frustrations that I experienced when I first started using the Chromebook um, and I guess we should go a little bit into the Chromebook is nothing. <laughs> we have ponies. These are the ponies of the apocalypse. When you hang out in tech with the two of us all of the time, you find that we get obsessed with memes. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we discovered the ponies of the apocalypse one day and Jen found stickers. Yes, thank you. Oh, I'll have to find the company name. We'll post that too. Sure. Um, I am Pestilence. I am war. And there are two others, and the kids go on scavenger yeah, hunts. Famine and death are roaming the building. To figure out who the other two horsemen of the apocalypse are. But we digress. This is how life is like with us. Yeah. Um, so when the Chromebook came out, the idea behind it, the Chromium OS, or the, the Chrome OS, is um, produced by Google, and it is nothing but web. And so when it first came out, it literally was nothing but web. One of the frustrations that I had as a, as a power user is I'm often using multiple windows. Mm -hmm. And while I don't mind tabbing back and forth between windows, what I desperately wanted to be able to do was the Snap 2 feature like you have in Windows. So I wanted to have one half on one screen and one half on the other screen. And that probably drove me to my Windows desktop more often than not when I was writing a paper. And so I discovered a couple of apps. There's a great app called Panelize that basically takes a, any web page that you're looking at and turns it into a pop-up panel that you can access, um, flip up and down at the bottom. And so I used that for the better part of a year. But what's happened is Chrome has now developed the Aura version of its OS. And what you essentially have is a desktop. Mm -hmm. And so they give you some nice pretty landscapes. I haven't actually figured out how to put my own pictures in there yet. Um, so either you can't do that yet or it's coming. And you can pin frequently used apps. So you see I have Chrome and Gmail and my Google Reader and some of my apps. And then you have an app tray. And so you can look at all of your Google apps just like you would in an all program. So they've really done a good job of giving you that desktop experience. Now, I think part of this is they're faking their way into some of the Windows market for people who got a little bit skeptical of not having a desktop. Mm -hmm. The most useful feature, though, by far, has been the idea of using Windows. And so when you open up your tab, you have the full screen, but by clicking this magic button here and dragging, you can drag a tab nice. to the right or the left hand side of the screen. It becomes even more effective, you can take a tab and drag it out to split the window, and then you can drag that other tab to the other side of the screen. So what you end up with is the same kind of split screen view that you can be used to when working on multiple documents or doing research. I think while I'm not a huge fan of the app bar, in fact, I, there was a Google Plus Hangout yesterday discussing the browser desktop, and I know that there were at least three or four people who plussed my comment about needing a way to see more apps because they only give you one screen worth of apps, and some of us have more than one screen worth of apps on our Chromebooks. Um, I think the idea of splitting the windows is going to be a huge thing in terms of making the Chrome Chromebook and the Chrome desktop more useful for education, more useful for business settings. And so I'm really glad they did that, even if it comes along with an app toolbar that makes it more like Windows. Outstanding. And so that's our product review. Yeah. We've covered what we read, and I think we have successfully completed our first video podcast. Awesome. Yes, all we did was put a list on a whiteboard, actually an interactive whiteboard, but we just used a marker on it. Um, and that's it. So this is our first informal one. We, we start presenting a lot this summer, so we're not going to be in the same place a lot. But yeah. we'll try and do this somewhat regularly. I think every two weeks is the goal. But, you know, if we get this big campaign to do more, we'll Yeah, and so um, I'll be around ISTE coming up here, and then Jen and I are both at Blackboard World. Yep. 
and then Jen will be at the Jesuit the symposium. symposium and the International Colloquium in Boston later and on. So we'll be around we'll be and we around. hope to see you. Come up, say hi. We might do some guest interviews as we're out on the road. And J.D. We actually will have uh, B, uh, the bingo if you like EdTech Lingo Bingo. He actually will have prizes for bingo cards if you see him at ISTE. So, yes, uh, find me at ISTE, <laughs> shout out bingo at any presentation I'm at, and I will have a prize for you. Uh, thank you very much, and if you have any questions or anything that you would like us to talk about, please feel free to comment Contact. below.